If, uh, if you have Bibles, I would encourage you to open them up to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 2. Gospel of Luke chapter 2. And uh, we'll start in verse 10 today. And of course, uh, talking about the advent or the coming of Christ into the world, there is uh, some reality that we're going to, uh, to, to wrestle with and grapple with. And the, the main sort of thing that I want to talk about today is, uh, can I get it to, can you see if that'll jump up? Maybe just... There we go. We're going to talk about, you know, it would really help if I turned this on. <laughs> What a doofus. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about how Advent or how Jesus coming into the world changes everything and how that uh, how Jesus coming into the world addresses major concerns and how we looked at last week, a major uh, you know, lots of just all sorts of stuff that it, it just it Jesus changes everything. He just changes everything. And so if uh, if you are the sermon note taking kind of a person, this blue sheet in your bulletin has some fill in the blanks and we will be going through those uh, a bit at a time and your very first one that we have is Jesus arrival makes our fears obsolete no matter how big they are. Jesus' arrival, His coming into the world, the advent of the Son of God on the scene, takes our fears and makes them utterly useless. If you are the kind of a person who worries a lot, if you are the kind of a person who has something just sort of kind of always in the back of your mind and like, how is this going to turn out? How is this going to work out? Or, or maybe something big has happened and it, ha and it causes all kinds of anxiety in you. Jesus coming into the world addresses that. And he actually takes that thing, that fear, that wants to, to pull your strings and control your heart and control your life. And he wants to take that fear and cut the strings off of your heart and say that this doesn't get to control you anymore. Because when Jesus shows up, Jesus changes the whole of how reality works from here on out. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 10 through 11. If you didn't bring a Bible with you today, I do have the text for you up on the screen with a number of things highlighted that we'll talk about throughout. So Luke chapter 2 verses 10 through 11. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So let's, let's back up and take these just kind of like one little bit at a time. So we have in this as scattered out throughout the rest of the birth narratives of Jesus, this phrase that the angels are prone to tell whoever they come up, uh, up to talk to, they always seem to want to start this way. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And part of that may have to do with just how stunning the appearance of the angels are. And you'll hear some people talk about, well, it's because the angels are so bright and they're so magnificent and they're such a, such a stark contrast to the world around them and everything else we could possibly know. And I think that may be part of it. But I think the other thing and the other reality that is addressed here is we're just prone to be fearful. We are prone to latch on to something that causes us anxiety and not let it go. And so when the angels come and they address the shepherds or they come and they address Mary or they come and address Joseph or, they, or, or, or whatever, they always begin this same way. Hey, don't be afraid. Well, why not? Because that's just who we are. We're fearful people. Whether we like to admit that or not, many of us like to pretend that we have our act together, don't we? We like to pretend that we are, yeah, everything's going really well and I don't have any major problems that 
I can't get over, but even in the back of our minds, when we say stuff like that, we're like, yeah, but there's, there's this. There's this thing. There's this person, or there's this event, or there's this problem, or there's this whatever it is, and it is controlling you. It is totally redefining who you are and how you live and move and have your being in the world. But Jesus steps into that. Jesus steps into the midst of that, that terrifying whatever it is and says, that's nothing. I've got that. I will take care of that. That doesn't have to control you. Fear not. For, behold, I bring you good news. Well, here's the reality about fear. And here's the reality about all of these, these sort of anxieties that we carry around with them. Those are, by definition, bad news that we hold on to. We like life to go smoothly, but I think that there's even, there's a sense in which we're addicted to drama. We're addicted to things not going well, and maybe not in our own lives, but in other people's lives. And we go, oh, that's terrible. Sort of. And we, we sort of enjoy the mess. Because we're so familiar with it. We're so present in it and we're so, that's all we know. That's what we're familiar with. That's how we have always lived. But Jesus steps into the bad news with good news. And this is why this is why the central reality for us as a church as who we are as God's people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word gospel simply means good news. And what is the good news? The good news is that Jesus Christ has come into the world. And he came to teach and to, uh, to do miracles. And we know all of that. If you read through the Gospels, you get this whole kind of a big picture. But it, of course, culminates with the, the important climax, the linchpin of all history. Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying on the cross to pay for the sin of the world, to pay for our brokenness, mine and yours. Jesus has good news for us. And the good news is you don't have to hold on to that brokenness and that sin and that mess and that anxiety and that fear anymore because I've killed it on the cross. Jesus has nailed your failures your fears, your mistakes, your flubs, your foolishness, your sin to his cross and killed it there. You don't have to keep holding on to that. That's why it's good news. And it's good news because in contrast to that stands the bad news. That all people are born broken and bent away from God by nature. And being born broken and bent away from God by nature, we would have a destiny, an eternal destiny bent away from God. Bent fully away from God, completely the other direction from God. And that destiny is is eternal conscious torment and separation from God. That's, that's bad news. Yes? That is not what, that's not the kind of news that you want to hear if you wake up one day and you find out you're headed for something horrifying. You don't want any part of that. You want to either begin trying to find a way out of that or you begin maybe rationalizing and making excuses. Oh, it's not as bad as it seems. But the reality is we can't do that. And we can't excuse ourselves from that. We absolutely require the good news of Jesus Christ to address the natural bad news that we face as human beings. Born broken and bent away from God. 
But there is this good news, good news of great joy. What is the antidote for anxiety and fear? Well, it's the joy of God. It is the pleasure of the presence of God in our lives. Do you know what joy is versus mere happiness? Happiness simply has to do with my circumstances are going pretty well. That's what happiness is. That's why the, you know, well, the, like the founding documents of our country talk about life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And that's the pursuit of the, the, the good situational reality of our lives that we can sort of manipulate. But that is not something that Jesus offers. Jesus offers something far better than that. Jesus offers a little thing called joy. And joy is not something that we can generate on our own. It's not something that we can legislate. It's not something that we can manipulate. It's not something that we can create. It is something simply that must be received. Joy has to be received. You can't just make it. You have to receive it. The angel said, do not fear. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. And that great joy will be for all the people. Fear is about ourselves being undone. Fear is about ourselves being undone. The good news of Jesus means eternal renewal. Being done up again. You cannot be undone fully if you are in Christ. Because he is in charge of that. Not you. Not somebody else. Nobody else gets to come into your life and heart and manipulate and undo you if you are in the grip of Jesus Christ. Because they are not as powerful as he. They can lie to you. They can trick you. They can say things that make your heart go, oh, not me. But they are not Christ and they do not control who you are in him. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In Jesus, God rescues us because we need to be rescued. We just need to be rescued. Once again, we do not manipulate our way out of our problems. We do not create brilliant, fashionable resources for ourselves to make sure our lives are as they should be. It is an act of Jesus Christ. It is an act of God to rescue us from the bad news and to give us the good news. God rescues us from creation's greatest enemies, sin and death. Sin and death. And here's the, here's the truth. Of course, uh, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, everybody is appointed death at one point or another. But if you are in Christ, you are appointed life eternal with God forever. That far exceeds whatever power that death tries to hold on you. Because in Christ, death is a blip on the radar. It's a speed bump that you hardly even notice. This is why Paul says uh, the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Because the glory that shall be revealed in us is the glory of God himself. And it far outshines the piddly, pathetic power of death and sin. It far outstrips the ability of sin to ruin your day. It far outstrips the ability of another person to come in and say something to you that makes you go, oh, not, not this again. This is good news that overshadows, overpowers, and overtakes all of the sin and all of the death that could ever possibly do anything to you. Jesus wins. Sorry if that's a spoiler for you. You know, if, if you didn't know that that was the end of the story, I've just ruined the book for you, I guess. But hopefully I didn't ruin that for you. Hopefully you knew that already. Jesus wins. Jesus has already 
one. The cross of Jesus Christ, the reason for which he was born into the world in the first place, was his triumph over sin and death, over all power, over all authority, over anybody who ever comes along and thinks they're the ones in charge. The cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the way that God says, nope, I win. Not you, me. You might want to be on his side, not your own. That's probably the best path forward for all of us, don't you think? Let's not let something else come along and try to overtake your day through fear and manipulation and anxiety. Because Jesus has something far better, and it's called joy eternal. Point number two, Jesus' arrival obliterates our ideas of power. Jesus' arrival obliterates our ideas of power. We have an understanding that is usually based on the world around us and our, our current cultural situation. This is true if you are in America. It's true if you're in Iran. It's true if you're in Africa. It's true if you're a pygmy somewhere in a forest. It's true everywhere. Is that We get these ideas of who's in charge and who's not by looking at the world around us and seeing who, who flexes their muscles the best. Who has the most authority or the most charisma or the most ability to get people to follow them or the most ability to crush those who refuse to follow them. And we look at situations like that and we say, well, that guy's in charge or that lady's in charge. Maybe you've had a boss at some point in your life and you're like, that person is ruthless, but I, I can't do anything about that. I can't speak up or I can't say anything because that person is... They're in charge. The reality is the coming of Christ and the world obliterates our ideas of power because it addresses even down to the, the personal relationships uh, and power struggles that we sometimes have in family and friendships and things like that. And it reminds us that, nope, that's actually not the way it is. Luke 2.12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying lying in a manger. So everything that he's said previous to this, everything the angel has told, uh, told us previous to this is that this is your new king. This is the new authority. This is the new true power that is, uh, that is to take the throne and to be in charge of the world. Oh, great. Fantastic. This is what we've been waiting for. Well, what does this king look like? He looks like a baby who doesn't even have a crib because his parents are so poor. This child, this king, lives in poverty. This king is not walking around, flexing his muscles, is not strutting around, swinging his sword. This king needs his diapers changed. This king is humble. This king is different because this king has a different way of power. And that power is not exercised predominantly through political intrigue and ability and through military might. This king exercises his power in a completely different way. The chapter, Luke chapter 2, begins with the greatest political superpower imaginable even to, compared to what we have today. If you understand what Rome had accomplished in terms of its conquering ability and where it had all of its tentacles reached out into the world and how it had its authority exercised in every corner of its empire. It was astonishingly powerful. And if you read Luke chapter 2, the first few verses, verses 1 through 3, this is what you read. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, top dog, 
Caesar Augustus that the world, that all the world, should be registered. And when Caesar says something, you jump to it. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor. There's another power position of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Well, what's fascinating about the early chap, the early part of Luke chapter 2 is its context is power, 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 power. This is who rules. This is who, and this, it's intentional, I think, on the part of Luke to give us this scene. Because everybody knew who Rome was. Everybody knew who Caesar Augustus was. Caesar Augustus was the first almost true Caesar that there was. The first one to really truly consolidate power. He even called himself a savior. There are, there are inscriptions that, are, that we have found, historical archaeological discoveries that, that, that attribute godhood and salvation to Caesar Augustus. And he's this big, amazing, powerful, charismatic sort of a person. And then he, when he decides to do something, the whole empire says, yeah, okay, well, we better do that or we're going to find ourselves in trouble. And a, whole, and a census, the purpose of a census was to know how many tax died you had available to come to you. And the reason an empire, especially one like Rome, counts its tax dollars is to know how it can flex its military muscle and how and where it can spend in its ability to conquer other kinds of places, especially at this time in history. This is what Rome is known for. Rome is known for how big and powerful and just unstoppable of a force it was. And yet, in the midst of that situation, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, Lord is fascinating because Lord is a title that Caesar reserved for himself. It was a common Roman greeting by the time you get to the New Testament time as you would greet somebody by saying, Caesar is Lord. How are you today? Caesar is Lord. Caesar is in charge. Have you heard? Did you know? Because they, the, the empire wanted everybody to know just who was in charge. And so they made it common to greet each other in this way. Hey, Caesar's Lord. Don't forget, there's that guy over in Rome and he's big and powerful and scary. Don't cross him or he'll put you on a cross. But there is this Christ the Lord, this Messiah, this promised chosen one who comes onto the scene. And how does he come on? Does he come on with great political power, swinging his sword? No, he's a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. He is the complete opposite in terms of what the world counts as power. The complete opposite. God's kingdom power is in humility and gentleness. It is in humility and gentleness. It is in, it is in the king not just throwing his weight around and saying, you better do this or you're dead. That is not how the kingdom of Jesus operates. That is not how it works. It cannot be seized and kept, this power, like political power can today. It cannot be obtained through a coup. It cannot be obtained by being smart enough and wise enough and have enough uh, backing uh, behind you. It cannot be seized and kept, and it cannot be won by popularity because that is not how the power of the kingdom of God operates. It operates through humility and justice gentleness in and through its king. Because there is no one more gentle than Jesus. How do we know that there's no one more gentle than Jesus? Are you still here? That's how you know. Because here's the reality behind gentleness. The gentleness is, is this. It is power under control. Caesar didn't control his power. He set it loose. And, and there are... Go read history. How many, how many Caesars were assassinated by members of their own family or other people who were interested in obtaining the power for themselves? They couldn't control their power. 
But Jesus can, and you know that He can because we're still here. And by His grace, we have been offered a place in His kingdom. Because here's the thing, we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It doesn't belong to us by right. It belongs to us merely as a gift of God's grace. Because he is a humble and gentle king who keeps his power under control and offers us a place, a seat at the table with him. Come to me, he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I won't overburden you, he says. I'm, I won't crush you. Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Well, what are those pictures of? A bruised reed is a, it's a, it's a tiny little thin plant that's already damaged. It would be so easy to break a bruised reed, but he, he refuses to. Why? Because he's gentle. Because his power is under control. A smoldering wick. If you blow out one of those candles, there will still be, there's, there'll still be a little bit of heat there, won't there? There'll still be a little bit of a, a glow. It says, a smoldering wick he will not quench. He won't, he won't fully put it out. Why? Because he's gentle. It would be so easy for him to do that. A smoldering wick he will not quench. A bruised reed he will not break. Why? Because he is a gentle and humble king. He doesn't throw his weight around like the kingdoms of the world do. So many people look at the world and they say, well, if God is so good and he is so powerful, why doesn't he do something about the problems in the world? Well, my question back on that is always this. If he starts there, why is he going to stop at you? Because he's not going to start there to begin with because he's gentle and humble. What exempts you from that question? What exempts me from that question? Why doesn't God right those wrongs? Because he, he, if he has to do those ones, then he has to do the wrongs in me too. And that means I'm toast. But so are you. But he chose to do it a different way. Well, what way did he do it? He chose to exhaust the power of sin and death and the political powers of the world by letting them do their worst to him. He exhausts the power of sin and death by humbly and gently going to the cross on our behalf, in our place. That's what, go read Philippians chapter 2. He became obedient, even obedient to death on a cross, which is the most humiliating, it's also related to the word humility, the most humiliating uh, torture and execution that had ever been invented. That was the purpose of the cross. And Christmas ties into all of this because without Christmas, there is no cross. Without Christmas, that gentleness and that humility does not get displayed. But it begins to be displayed here at Christmas. It begins to be displayed here at the birth of the king. He does it from day one. A baby. Wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. A poverty-stricken family who are forced out of their home to travel a long distance to register for the superpower's pleasure in their own town. And they can't, even, they can't even get into an inn. They can't get into any sort of wayside place. There's no family who are able to take them in. They are just so out there by themselves that they have to sleep in a stable somewhere. And there's no crib for this baby when he's born. They have to put him in a manger. Talk about humiliating. But that's who our king is. That's who our king is, you guys. Point number three. Jesus' arrival changes our objectives. Jesus' arrival changes our objectives. What are your what are your goals in life? Do you have any? I, I hope you, you all do. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how many miles you got on the odometer. 
You got you got stuff you want to get done, right? Still do that's fine but but how are those objectives how are those goals shaped how do you determine those Luke chapter 2 verses 13 through 14 and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased and so we see two of the major objectives or two of the shaping realities for all of our choices and objectives and, and goals that we have and how we set those things up we screen those through the filters of these two realities. First is glory to God. Praising God becomes a priority. Praising God becomes a priority. Well, why? Because He's God and He deserves it. He's not some narcissist who needily follows around us and, and says, "Well, you, please just just praise me, please. I just I just want you. I want you to affirm me. I want you to make me." That is not God. If you've ever met a really, really needy person, he's not like that. He desires our praise and for us to give him glory because he deserves it, because it is all rightfully his. It belongs to him, which is why you have passages like Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Well, why? Because that's what they're made for. That's what you and I are made for. We're made to declare the glory of God. We're made to praise him. That's why church makes sense to do, by the way. Well, isn't it just sort of odd that a handful of people get together on a particular day of the week and sing some songs and listen to a guy yell at them about the Bible for you know half an hour or whatever and then just go home? Isn't that weird? Well, if you just take it at face value, yeah, it is. But if you take the fabric of reality as what the Bible actually tells us it is supposed to be, it makes total sense. Because we are God's gathered people who gather to praise Him him to give him the glory he rightly deserves glory to God in the highest that's glory to God all the way all the way to the heavens glory as high as you can possibly imagine and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased we become advocates of peace we become advocates of peace, and that means a lot of things. That means a lot of different stuff. It means that we live peaceably with one another. It means that we advocate for peace where there isn't peace. But ultimately, and at, at a fundamental level, it means God wants to be at peace with mankind. God wants to be at peace with humanity. And the only way for that to happen is if they are able to give him glory. And the only way they are able to give him glory is if they are rescued by him. We are advocates of peace in that we advocate peace between broken, sinful, uh, messy humanity and holy, righteous God. Well, those things don't fit together, do they? A holy, righteous, powerful God who could, if he wanted to, snuff us out in a fraction of a nanosecond. And us, with all of our bundles of foolishness and bad choices and mistakes and intentional sins and all of the stuff that we carry around with us and try to hide from each other and ourselves and God, but that doesn't work because, well, he's God. Broken, sinful, unrighteous humanity and righteous, holy God don't normally coexist with each other. And so something has to change. And it's not God that has to change. It is us. And it's not that we can clean ourselves up and make ourselves presentable for God. That is utter foolishness. There's no way that we can accomplish that. It must be through an act of His grace. It must be through an act of His love. If you read through the Bible, once again, 1 John chapter 4, uh, what you find out is that this is who God is by default. God is 
love. That is who he is. He is love. Does he have wrath and fury? Yeah, he has all of that. He exercises all of that when appropriate, but his disposition is to love. He wants to show us love. He desires to redeem, repair, restore, resurrect his broken people. That's what his heart's desire is. That's why there is a Christmas to begin with. If that weren't true, Christmas would make zero sense. Christmas is what it is because God is love. And he loves you. And he desires his relationship with you to be redemptive and restorative and resurrection powered. Not just, I'll hang out with him for an hour and a half on Sunday and that'll be it. It changes all of our objectives. It changes our whole life. It opens us up to a completely different way to live, which is why the teachings of Jesus are so earth-shattering to us sometimes, because they're so counterintuitive to what we would normally think. But they are the ways in which Jesus tries to show us this is the way of the love of God. Do you want to live in this? To be able to live the way God has called us to live, we must first bend our knee and say, God, I'm broken and I'm a sinner and I need your salvation because I cannot do this on my own. I have not the power, the strength, the intelligence, the charisma, the ability, the know-how, the anything to earn or project or to create or to progress or to whatever, any of this on my own because I have not that strength. Only God, you do. Save me. Save me. Because I cannot save myself. I cannot. Praising God becomes a priority for God's people because all other powers are shown to be subservient. Nothing deserves your praise like God does. Nothing does. No celebrity, no president, no political authority or party or it all must bend a knee to Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 says one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I would rather do that ahead of time than have to do it because I can't help but recognize it and it's too late for me. Do it now. Do it now. Let's talk about some questions for reflection and then an action step. Question number one, what fear troubles you lately? What is nagging at you? What causes anxiety in your heart? What is clawing at you lately that you're so afraid of and that you're allowing to control your reactions and your choices? Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do not fear. Number two, is there another power vying for your affection and attention apart from Christ? And are you letting it have that? Are you letting it have that? Are you letting something else be Lord? Are you letting something else take that throne? But Jesus is Lord. Here's an action step. I will allow Jesus to speak into my fears and my ideas of power and to change my life's objectives to praise and peace. Let's pray. Father, you have done amazing things this Christmas and every Christmas past. 
for what Jesus has done at the first Christmas echoes to this day. His power exercised in gentleness and humility is unavoidable. We cannot ignore it. Or if we do, we do so to our own peril. Help us to be people of your power in humility and peace. Help us to change our objectives. Help us to see our fears obliterated and made obsolete and obliterate our, our ideas of power. Help us to praise you and you only. Help us to lift our hearts to you as we receive the joy that only comes on account of what Jesus has done by coming into the world, by living a life completely without sin, and by dying on a cross to pay for our sin and brokenness, and rising again to new life to give us eternal life and to give us eternal joy. Let there be joy to this world. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.